Hey listeners of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, uh, it's Seb Ostrovich here again from Weightlifting House. I'm just going to hijack Josh's feed to let you know that he and I have been working to bring back Coaches Only this March 18th and 19th. What is Coaches Only? Coaches Only is an online coaching conference presented by world-leading experts via Zoom to you directly in your, your home or your gym or wherever you are. It's two days of cutting-edge education, expert insights, you know, incredible actionable takeaways from seven of the most knowledgeable and influential coaches uh, and researchers in the world of weightlifting. And for the first time ever, Josh uh, is going to be one of the speakers, which I'm incredibly excited and proud of him for. All of these talks are presented live, but you can access them on demand as well if you're not able to make all of the sessions. You will be able to ask questions to the speakers, interact with your peers, and generally just take your understanding of, of coaching, programming up another level. Will Fleming from One Kilo said that coaches only may be the most valuable opportunity a weightlifting coach has to improve. Greg Everett from Catalyst Athletics said that the coaches only event is not just a perfect way to allow developing coaches access to the insights and experience of successful coaches, but for those experienced coaches to connect with others and continue their own improvement. Spencer Arnold from Power and Grace said that the first coaches only seminar exceeded his expectations in every way. He said, I was shocked at how much I was able to immediately apply to my own coaching. Sergei Putsov said the value of this event is outstanding for the weightlifting community. And there are plenty of coaches who are much earlier on in their career who have said that this is the most valuable thing they've ever had as a coach. So whether you're a beginner coach or an elite level coach, Coaches Only is for you. It's March 18th to 19th, and you can get an early bird price now. It's $50 off if you get your ticket. So we'll put a link to that down below in the description of Josh's podcast. We really look forward to seeing you there, and uh, enjoy the show. My name is Joshua Gibson, and you are listening to the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast, a show dedicated to promoting a message of critical thinking as it pertains to strength training, nutrition, and well-being. This is done through interviews with experts, high-level athletes, coaches, and people heavily involved in strength sports and athletic development. Pull up a chair, grab a coffee, and let's get on to today's podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Gibson, and we are joined today by the one and only smiling Seb Ostrovich. <laughs> Is How's this the going, hottest Seb? intro of your life? It's, so it's difficult because I'm so used to you introing the show anytime we're on, and then it's also just such a good, you, you just execute so well. So Thank I feel you. like the, I feel like not only am I doing it for the people but i'm i'm doing it for you and for the culture. that's 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 quite the quite the chore or not not chore but it's it's quite the feat to live up to yeah well i'm good thanks for having me i think that you must feel awful right now because it's not even 4 a.m and you're up super early to get this podcast in before you have a flight to go and do some seminars in canada or wherever it is that you're flying off to teach <laughs> so you must be exhausted yeah, I'm very tired. It's it's funny though because that doesn't that never stops me from scheduling. Somehow I scheduled a podcast, uh, a virtual, uh, like virtual session with my my therapist, and then we like f head to the airport at six a.m. So right, so somehow made it a full day. You're getting uh, a lot of work in before you fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. uh, which seems seems to be the move and. Um, Speaking of work, you got you just announced coaches only yesterday, which uh -huh. this is going to date the podcast, but this is going to come out on the uh, ninth. It's the eighth today, and and the the early bird registration started on the seventh. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, coaches only is back. I just think it's um. I remember when I first started it. It was a lot of work to set up, but I was sort of overwhelmed by how valuable it was for the coaches. Like the feedback that we got from not only like the elite coaches who turned up, but also just your everyday coach, beginner coaches, intermediate coaches. It was just like kind of overwhelming and made me realize like, okay, we've got, uh, you know, kind of like lightning in a bottle for coaches here, mm. but they were so time consuming. We did like for the first year and then it just became way too much with all the other stuff that we were doing at Weightlifting House. So I haven't done one in a year. And then I basically reached out to you 
because you're so much more on the pulse of weightlifting coaching mm. these days and weightlifting education. I just said, Josh, can you, here's how we do it. Here's like the blueprint. These are literally the emails that we send out. Can you organize this and just get it done? I want to have minimal involvement in it. And you were just like, hand me your beer. So <laughs> like, I handed you my, my lukewarm beer. You rechilled it. You took it out and you've just been nailing the uh, coaches only. So yeah, we're, we're, we're going to be, uh, when is it? It's going to be March 18th, 19th. So we've got, we've got yeah. a month and a half until until we go. But yeah, two days, eight hours of incredible talks from world-leading experts, live on demand, ask questions, keep the presentations, speak to your peers. It's going to be it's going to be pretty um, pretty epic, I think. Yeah, and I think one thing that Weightlifting House has always done well, and I don't think they have, they're, they're going to execute any differently on this, is they make something that can feel overly like formal or official, like really comfortable, really fun. Um, they, 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 I don't know. Weightlifting House has this way of making something feel like, uh, like you're, you're one of your great friends did it. Right. So right. We, we were bringing on like Kyle Pierce and, and Kyle, Dr. Kyle Travis, uh, Dr. Kyle Pierce, uh, Kyle Travis, Kevin Simons, Jim Rudder, uh, Sarah, Sarah Minta. Minta. And, and it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, some of the biggest names. And I, it was kind of funny. I was talking to Sarah yesterday uh, because I put that post up and, and tagged her in it. And she, we were just talking about how she can she can share it and help help uh, get it out to people. And she's like, hey, should I mention that in the uh, little bio for me, it says we made we made sixty seven thousand dollars in revenue um, that month. She's yeah. like, well, we, we made more than that last month. Yeah. Should, should I change it? And I was like, no, I think people get the idea that you're like a hyper successful gym. Right, right, right. And, that is amazing uh, revenue to make for a gym. It's insane. Yeah, it's very impressive. It's insane. So it's like we have a, a stacked lineup, but it's not going to feel like a, like it's not going to feel like something that's a, a, a conference or something where you just come in, you see a presentation and that's kind of it. It's gonna feel like just a like I don't know two day long podcast that you can be involved with, mm -hmm. and and kind of sit in on as some of the some of your favorite favorite people chat about weightlifting and the right. things they've spent their entire lives trying to understand. Uh, so I think it's just like a really unique opportunity for people in that respect. Oh, absolutely, yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, and that is going to be linked down below for people who yeah. want to check it out see what everyone is actually presenting on and they can learn more about it. Um, this show specifically is going to dig into the timeline of weightlifting house. And I think what that's going to do is, is act as a way to kind of explore a lot of things that seven, I've kind of talked about over the years, either directly or indirectly and kind of like piece together. Uh, but I thought it makes sense to make a more formal episode where we can kind of explore it, uh, just in like a, a, a more um, planned and then more intentional way instead of just kind of like happening to touch on, you know, uh, walking behind Glenn's place and going and grabbing chicken eggs, you know, right. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the morning before a big breakfast. So uh, we kind of came up with the idea during, I think it was a, it, was, it might've been a morning brew episode or a, a weightlifting house podcast episode. Um, and, and this is kind of the execution of that. So Seb, maybe you can start by getting into when weightlift, I don't, I don't know how early yeah. on you kind of plan to, to, to start this, but. This podcast is brought to you by Onyx Weightlifting Co. I've been very selective about finding sponsors for the show, but after much deliberation in conversation with Chris and Danny, the co-owner and founder, we decided that Onyx is beyond a great fit to support this podcast. Onyx is a brand built on providing the strongest and most comfortable straps, wraps, belts, and apparel to the weightlifting community with the leather products handcrafted by the same barbell calloused hands that you have. Make sure you pick up something today at onyxstraps.com using the code PHILWL for 10% off of your purchase. That is onyxstraps.com, O-N-Y-X straps.com using the code P-H-I-L-W-L 
for 10% off of your purchase. And thanks as always for supporting the show. So I have, I have one, I've written down, I started going through all of the list of events and I actually didn't get very far because lots of different things were happening and I realized I was going to get through too many bits of paper, but I've gotten through the first like year or so, but prior to, or a couple of years, but prior to that, there's one event that sticks out, um, which probably started the whole thing off winter 2012. Mm. I did my first ever weightlifting session and I did an 80 kilo clean. And I remember, I remember, so I was a, uh, I think I was a rower back then. Mm. And I remember doing that 80 kilo clean day one and being so like amazed. And, and I think that like, as far as first sessions go, that's not bad. It's not amazing, but it's okay. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to my row of friends, I was like, guys, I just cleaned 80 kilos. I was like, I, I took it, I got it from the ground to my shoulders and then got up with it. And they just didn't, there was, they were just absent. They had no interest. <laughs> and I was so like, it was like the most unbelievable thing. I couldn't believe that I'd just done that. Like the weight sounded good, but also just the movement was fluid and I'd done it. So that, that kind of triggered me and I got into weightlifting. But the first like uh, mention of weightlifting house was September, 2015. Mm. It was my third wow. year of university at Exeter having already, this is my third university because I was just dropping out, struggling, couldn't work out what I wanted to do. Finally settled on sports science. Third year, moved into a house to Clinton Avenue with a bunch of weightlifters. There were six of us in the house. And all bar one, I'd basically gotten into weightlifting. The other guy, Ben, he had started weightlifting maybe a year before me. And he and I were the first two weightlifters at that university, at that gym. We trained together. We gradually got everyone else in. Uh, and then we we all decided to live together. Um, so that was that first year. At the end of the year, we all kind of realized, okay, we're obsessed with weightlifting, like hyper obsessed. We train together, we eat together, we watch weightlifting together, we stretch, all of these things. It's like nonstop weightlifting competition. We all snatch between 100 and 130 kilos ish at the time. We all clean and jerk between 120 and 160. So we were all pretty competitive, the six guys. And uh, I was like getting kind of terrified towards the end of the year that that was coming to an end. I think most people had plans like they were going to go off and do a master's or they were going to mm. move to like Ferg moved to the USA. They were going to get other jobs. I was terrified by the rapidly approaching deadline that was the end of university because I, I couldn't, um, I'd always said to myself, there's no way I'm going to sit and work in mm. an office doing something not related to weightlifting. Like I just knew I couldn't do that. Um, so I actually messaged Glenn, Glenn Pendler, who lots of the listeners will know of, um, in sort of like May of 2016, he had just come out of his stroke. He had a stroke while coaching at MD USA. He'd come out of his stroke and he was looking to sort of get back into the weightlifting game. And he'd sort of mentioned that, you know, he was he was getting back into coaching. I sent him a message saying, hey, me and all of my friends will fly to the USA. We will all train under you. We all want to be Olympians and we will just live and train. And I was speaking on behalf of all my friends who hadn't okayed this at all and wouldn't have okayed it at all. I was the only one who would have probably gone and done it. Um, But I got nothing back. And then maybe, oh my God, uh, four months later in, uh, I don't know, September, once we'd all basically split up, I and everyone had gone off to do different jobs. I was living with one of them. And we continued to live together for years, me and George. And, you know, he still trains on weightlifting AI. He's still one of my best friends. They all are, but um, I was still living with him. And I got this reply from Glenn. He was like, yeah, come out to the USA and we will, we'll give it a go. I'll give you like a try. He basically said, like, I'll give you a trial run and then we'll go from there. And uh, he told me the price of the, ca- it was basically a camp and he wanted us to come to the camp so we could make money is realistically <laughs> what happened. And I said, look, Glenn, the, the, the it's too expensive. We can't do it. So he dropped the price for us. And uh, the six of us flew out. I think it was six. Yeah, six of us flew out in December of 2016. Uh, I think it was like December 1st. I remember we came back on the 22nd. It was like a proper three week camp. Uh, and that's where I met Glenn. And that's where, that's basically where I guess Weightlifting House as a concept started because he was the first person I'd ever met in weightlifting who, who was 
bigger in weightlifting than any mm. of us six because like we weren't big at all we were tiny we didn't know anyone no one knew us but i had never met like properly yeah. met elite level lifters i'd been to seminars with sonny webster and gareth evans which is very cool but i'd never i hadn't gotten to know anyone so he was the first person i got to know and um you know this bit's maybe even I, i'll skim over this bit because i've said it so many times but i kind of had that feeling of i cannot leave here without having set something up like i'm in the position now where opportunity is rife i'm with the guy who i consider to be the most successful well-known coach in the world and i can't just leave i can't this can't just end i have to work something out so i just said to him glenn what if i set up a seminar tour in the uk uh and you flew over i organized the whole thing i drove you around and people turned up and you just taught them weightlifting you know it's v- like i basically said i will do all of the work I'll do everything. You just fly in. I'll book your flights. Just just turn up and make money. That's basically the deal I laid out for him. So he obviously said yes, which I think is a good lesson to anybody trying to work with someone who's way above them is just like give them a deal or an offer that is so good that they can't say no. It's like, go and turn up and I'll make you money and you won't do any work. This is basically <laughs> what I said. Yeah. Um, so Glenn said yes, and that tour was going to be in April. So I, you know, I, I've said this many times, like I, I didn't know how to drive. I spent all my money on driving lessons, failed tests multiple times. And like the day before Glenn turned up, I, I passed my test or something like that. And, um, which was terrifying. And we drove around and we did, you know, we did this tour and it was whilst we were doing that tour that he said, and I was working at the university gym at this point, cause I'd finished university. He said to me, okay, you need to start something. Do you have a name for something? You need a business, a brand. And I remember I said, what about the weightlifting platform? Mm. And he was like, that's quite good. I liked it because it was like a platform that you stand on, like a platform that you lift on, and also like the platform of of news and all that sort of stuff because I wanted to do news. And then I said, well, you know, we lived in a house. We called it Weightlifting House. We had a YouTube channel called Weightlifting House. He's like, that's it. Go with that. Anyway, I'm just going to stop because otherwise... I could just see myself not stopping for an hour. So I'm going to stop yeah. so that there's a point for you to like interject. I also need to speed up a lot. <laughs> I recognize that. No, this is perfect. I think, um, I think I want to actually comment on something that I never really considered in, in, in thinking about myself, maybe I, I could generate some sort of answer, but I, I find it surprising when you talk about your background, talk about everything that you've done, and then looking at where you're at now, you kind of mentioned dropping out of, of university a few times or like yeah. changing schools a few times. To me, that's very surprising because when I hear you talk about your background and what you've done, like you seem like someone who like, work, I mean, you obviously work very hard. Uh, like I do very now. Edu- you're very educated. Like, yeah. It, it's surprising that you were so unsuccessful in your first few attempts at university. Mm. Yeah, I went to a, I went to a very good school, like a, a private school that my parents worked at, and um, they were both teachers. So I got to go basically for free, which was really obviously I couldn't have gone otherwise. And so I got a really good education, but I was I have um, like i get hyper obsessed with different things so i would get during my school i got obsessed with rugby i got obsessed with basketball i got obsessed with parkour mm. i got obsessed with uh playing the violin just different things i go back and forth across get hyper obsessed with and lose i'd have tunnel vision on that one thing um and i would lose everything else and i could never do academic work like i did i did very well getting into that school like i was pretty high up um, and then at the school, I just, I just, it wasn't for me. Like I, everything outside of education, I loved, like I loved doing the sports. I did drama, I did music. I did, I was in all, I was on the athletics team, cross country team, rugby team, basketball team, did everything. Um, but didn't enjoy the school side of things. Um, and compared to like most people in the country, I did well in my exams because I was at a good school. So I got a good education, mm. but within the school, like my end of, like we have them GCSEs, you take them when you're 16 and then a levels when you're 17 and 18, those like relative to my year, I, I was pretty low down um, and had no interest in what I was studying. 
and then went to university, continued to have no study, but also had nobody there making sure I went to lectures. So I didn't go to any lectures or seminars. I just went to the gym and just trained. Um, and periodic, like I would get to like Christmas and realize I'm, I don't know anything. I haven't learned anything. I'm going to fail everything. Panic, drop out like a few months later and then start again. That happened a couple of times. And then even at my final university, where I did sports science, it was the exact same thing. I was hyper obsessed by weight, with weightlifting. And I turned up in September and all I did was weightlifting. I did, you know this, I did like the double day squat program because it was the hardest program, even though I could only snatch like 80 kilos at the time. And um, didn't go to any lectures, was failing everything. Came home at Christmas, told my parents I'm dropping out. And they were just like, just try it. Just try and stick with it, stuck with it and sort of, it was actually, <laughs> I met um, Charlotte, my now fiance. She was there in first year. And at the end of that first year, right around exam time, she was like single and I was single. And she was like, do you want to revise with me? And because I wanted to spend time with her so that I could like eventually ask her to be my girlfriend, wow. I accidentally revised and got really high marks at the end of the year. So it was, <laughs> she basically... Um, I sort of accidentally started succeeding by being around her academically because she's so, you know, she's a PhD. She's very successful academically. So she, her hard work rubbed off on me. And that's when I became hardworking and, you know, was able to focus properly on weightlifting house, I think. Yeah, I think one thing that I find interesting, and I don't, I don't, I want to say that it's unique amongst us uh, in like maybe a, a smaller group, but but maybe it's not. So I, I recently recorded a, a podcast with Ryan Doris and uh, yeah, it was, it's actually, I think one of the ones before this, maybe the, the last one or the one before that, but yeah, you did it last weekend, I think. Or last, yeah. Yeah. So he actually has a very similar story and he was a very, a very good track athlete. Um, so good that his brother, his brother's actually uh, an Olympian. He, he competed in Rio. And yeah, so he comes from like a a background of just really high level, high achieving athletics. And he kind of has a similar story. He, he uh, came out of high school, really high level athlete, went to university, just like, wasn't ready for it, like wasn't Mm -hmm. prepared. And, and kind of like what we had talked to Ryan and I had talked about before the show and what he mentioned on the podcast is like, he didn't really drop out. He just kind of like receded from university it's like you don't tell someone you're quitting you just like stop showing up right it's like suddenly you're there and then suddenly you're not yeah. um and i i think it's interesting to hear that you did that as well and and ryan did that and then you know ryan obviously then he, he went back again for track kind of failed again and then yeah. and then went to a community college And then eventually now, you know, now he has two master's degrees and it's just like, it like makes no sense. Like the trajectory that he was able to get on. What do you think it is that allowed you to kind of like fail, fail and then try again and then not only succeed, but become what I would, what I would call like hyper successful in the sense that you're really doing your own thing, right? Like you started your own business. um, You created something that like, hasn't really existed uh at least like in this iteration or this capacity and then developed something not only that doesn't exist but exists in like a a really kind of like niche sport and occupies a very like special space in in weightlifting like why do you think there's that kind of similar story arc or storyline of of kind of like repeated failure but then like hyper success um, I think I have very, um, very like extremely low risk aversion mm. as it's like a natural trait. Maybe, I don't know if it's in, well, I don't know if it's an, I don't know if it's a, a thing that I was born with. I just generated over time, but like my risk aversion is extremely low. I have, I have almost no fear of, I have literally no fear of failure. Like I just yeah. never understood it. Um, I, I think I'm. I have a tendency to be relatively like happy. Like I've got a pretty good, like I, I'm, I enjoy what I do a lot. And I always just had this feeling of like, 
if it doesn't work, like so what? It, I, I'll just try again. I'll just try it differently. I'll just change it. And I think as as maybe we go through the Whale of Child story, you'll see that it's like it, I tried it to be this one thing. It didn't work, so I yeah. changed it into this other thing. Then I changed it into another. I just sort of don't have a. Um, I'm not nervous about it going wrong. I mean, I, maybe I'm more so nervous now <laughs> because I have more people who depend on me for yeah. it to succeed. But um, yeah, I'm very low in risk aversion. And I don't know, maybe there was enough of a safety net at home when I was growing up where like I would regular, like I would not do my homework over and over again, get told off, get a detention. And then I just go back to school the next day. And it's like, oh, nothing's happened. I'm still fine. I don't have to do these things or whatever I did it just didn't matter. Um, you know, my parents are very kind, you know, they, they knew yeah. that I didn't love academics. They knew that I just, I just did all the other stuff and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, and, and also here's, here's the other thing because I was so bad academically. Like when I say so bad, like I actually got like nationally, I think I got very high marks at the end of my school and that sort of thing. But like, again, I was at a very good school. So like the standard of what you had to, you had to do a test to get into the school. It wasn't easy to get in. And then the standard there was so high. So I was still pretty low down within that. But like, I, I just had no interest whatsoever. And I knew, I just knew, like, I cannot um, do a normal job. Like I will fail. I I can't, um, I actually couldn't become a lawyer. Like maybe I wouldn't even be able to, but if I did somehow become a lawyer, I would be terrible and I would quit. Or I couldn't be an accountant. I couldn't be all these various things. Like when I had, you know, I, I used to work in a bar when I was at university, like a pub. And, you know, I would just s- steal alcohol, I'd drink. I would, you know, uh, I'd call in sick and say I couldn't come in. Like uh, when I worked at Holland and Barrett, which was, like a, it's like GNC, but in the UK, like a supplement store, I would lock myself in the downstairs toilets, play on my phone. I would go down and pretend to be getting stuff ready to bring up. I'd stack loads of boxes and then I would just sit there and wait. And as soon as I heard mm. steps, I'd pick up the boxes and covers. I'm a dreadful employee. Like I, <laughs> if it's something that I'm not interested in, I'm absolutely disgraceful at it. Yeah. So um, I just, and I need, I knew that about myself. I was like, okay, if you don't make it work, doing something that you love, which which wasn't weightlifting, it was just weightlifting. It was just be a weightlifting coach. Mm. If you don't make it work, then you are screwed. But also couple that with like the fear, like I don't, I'm not really scared of failing. It just meant that I was able to just take multiple bats at, at giving it a whirl. Why do you think? So we kind of up to this point got to you bringing Glenn over to the UK. Yeah, to yeah. do a bunch of a bunch of seminars um, and to kind of generate a relationship and, and to, to you know to be able to provide for him because ultimately it was like how do I how do I help Glenn so that we can yeah. develop some sort of relationship by which we can both, both take advantage of it yeah right you know up to that point what do you think it was about weightlifting that allowed you to stay so in, involved or invested because as you mentioned it's like as long as it's under my own terms. I, I'm, yeah. I can, I can work hard. I can, yeah, I can yeah. invest in myself. I can invest in whatever it is that I'm, I'm, I'm doing and put forth an effort that's going to get me where, I, where I want to go. Mm-hmm. If it's under someone else's terms that yeah. it, it's not going to, it's not going to work well. Yeah, um, yeah. What was special about weightlifting? Because as you mentioned, the, the, like the idea of doing a lot of things and doing them well is like attractive. Um, it's like a, it's a nice like background to a story by which you specialize, mm. but that also means that you did a lot of things that you eventually stopped doing. Yeah. yeah. So what was it about weightlifting that like up to this point you were yeah, years yeah. in and then suddenly you're creating this like decision tree that's going mm-hmm. to put you in it for, I don't know, you mentioned the start of this at like the start of the story, at, like 2012, mm. it's like almost still, it's like 11 years ago. Right. So what made weightlifting an 11 year pursuit? So I, I did all of these sports growing up, but I was way better at training. I I was Mm. way better at the sport on my own in isolation than I was in a group. I was quite scared and nervous. So like, 
I would, I played basketball in my garden every day for years, obsessed, played all the games, loved it. Um, and I knew that I had better ball handling, better shooting, all of these things uh, than anyone in my school. I just knew it. I was like, I know I'm going to, I have to be better. Maybe not everyone, but most people. And then when I turned up to play, I was just nervous of like kids who, I was quite small at school. I'm quite tall now. I'm like six one, but I was pretty small at school. I was nervous of like bigger kids, cooler kids, uh, faster kids. Like, you know what I mean? So I would shy away. I wouldn't take the shot. I wouldn't make the pass. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask for the ball. It was the same in rugby. Like I knew that I had much higher skills on my own than what I could demonstrate in a group. And that used to really annoy me because I was just too nervous to show it. And then along with that, I had this like obsession with, you know, when I was like nine, I smuggled dumbbells to my friend's house to lift weights. Cause I was, I just, for some reason I was just drawn to lifting weights. I loved it. And during my teenage years, I would just, I, I never had a games console, um, but I had like a, a laptop or whatever. I used to just watch uh, training videos of all the elite lift uh, athletes that I could find in the sports that I enjoyed. So I watched everything on uh, Johnny Wilkinson, Jonah Lomu, uh, Rock of Hoko, these, these rugby players. And then on the basketball side, anything with Kobe or LeBron or mm. Vince Carter or Trace McGrady, I just watch as much training as I could. Whenever there was a scene where they were in the gym and they were – you know, doing stuff to strengthen their, their, their hands or their, their feet or their legs or anything for their sport. I would just watch it on repeat, like the 30 second segment where all these players are in the gym or they're talking to the trainer. I was just so hyper obsessed with, I was like, Oh, that's where all the work gets done. Mm. Do it there. Then I got into rowing, which was low. Most of that is training on your own. Like you're on a machine on your own or you're in the gym. And then occasionally you get in a boat. So I really liked that. And I, in the rankings, I got to like number two in the university for the, for like our year. Um, I was really good on a machine. And then the same thing happened. Like I made the top boat, but as soon as we were in a competition with other people, I would shy away. We'd go to these, like, I don't know what you call them, regattas, where all the universities turn up, we'd race and I would be nervous and not put everything in for fear of like dying too soon even though I was in better shape than basically everyone. Um, and then I saw CrossFit and I was like, oh, this is perfect because you, the whole thing is training. It's all of the stuff that I love. You're just in the gym. And then when you go to compete, there's no one else that you have to do it with. So you just do your own thing. So I got hyper obsessed with that, like more obsessed with CrossFit than I'd ever been with anything, even though I didn't do it because I was still a rower, but I was just like, watched everything, knew everything, watched everything multiple times. Finally dropped out of Warwick, my second university. And I was like, I got to give this a go. First day they said, okay, you need to learn how to snatch and clean and jerk. Mm. I was like, cool, I'll do this for six months. If I can snatch 80 and clean and jerk 100, I'll be like, good. That means I'll be good enough to be an elite crossfitter. I'll win the games. Got into weightlifting like that and then just fell in love with that the most. And then and then that became like an interest in John North, Cal Strength, Glenn Penblay. And then a few years of just weightlifting, finally meeting Glenn. So that's how like, like sport as like a, the base of the triangle of all of these sports just gradually led towards like an individual lifting weights pursuit. Yeah. And now that we're 30 minutes in, I, I feel like <laughs> I should redirect us back to kind of the storyline right. that you were creating. So you bring yeah, I can go over it quicker. No, no, no. I think it, you do. I mean, it's perfect. This is, this is really interesting. Uh, so you bring Glenn over to the UK yeah, and yeah. then you start doing seminars. Mm -hmm. What were those conversations like and, and kind of what was the, what was the feeling like that you had now having Glenn over in the UK and working with him? And, and you, you can, if you go on your fit, your Facebook or, or if you just like look around for pictures, there's like a picture of you, you and Glenn in the UK some of you, some of you guys doing seminars together, like that must have been a really surreal feeling. Yeah, uh, it was like so magical. There were various magical moments in your life that you look back on. Yeah, and in the moment, you know, maybe they're not. They don't feel magical. Maybe they feel <laughs> stressful and nerve wracking because you're like, I need to make the most of this. But in hindsight, rose tinted glasses is just this magical thing. And I just remember like waking up. I was never an early riser, but Glenn would wake up at six every day. 
And so I was like, okay, well, I didn't know that that made you a successful person. So I was starting to wake up at six. Mm. I'd get downstairs before Glenn. I'd make like 16 eggs. We'd have eight <laughs> each in for, in like wraps with salsa. That was what we had every morning. <laughs> and he would just get out his laptop and just start work. And he would write a program. He would reply to emails. He would get to work on his next book. Like w- w- mm. just he had this like business of weightlifting and that just blew my mind. I didn't know that you could do that. So that's when he told me to make my own one so that I could sit there with him every morning for these three weeks and do my own thing. So I made the domain, I made the website and I started writing up my own programming. I started putting up news and we would drive to the seminars, but they were only the weekend. So we had like Monday to Friday together each week. And, but we would, and we'd go to the gym and he'd watch me train and we'd come back. And all of these car journeys are like half an hour, they're two hours, you know, and we're just talking about weightlifting. And I have like, I feel like I could be wrong, but I was so, I, I assume that I was the most interested in weightlifting that a a person had ever been that Glenn had met. That's what Mm. I think I was. I don't think Glenn had met anyone other than himself, maybe, who had that, like, I was asking him about everything. It was like, Okay, Glenn, when you teach your penlay position, step two, you hinge over at the knee all the way beyond the knee. So your straight legs, the bar's below the knee. But when you push from the floor and you come the other way, you don't want to be below the knee by the time your legs are straight. Like, why is that? And I'd question him on things that maybe he hadn't even thought of Mm. so much. I'd be like, how is it with this? What about this athlete? Why wouldn't you program like this? Just like, I needed to know all these answers. And he was, and because all these... unanswered questions were causing me so much internal stress I couldn't work out weightlifting (laughs) that I had to ask him because he was a source of it and then towards the end of it he was like Seb I need to get back into doing a podcast I've tried doing it with someone else they just don't have the questions they don't have the interest Mm. it doesn't work do you want to do it and I was just like you know I'd I'd listened to thousands of hours this is what you and I spoke about on the last episode we we listened to those podcasts with him and John and Donnie and everyone over yeah. and over again like i had i would listen to my favorite podcasts 10 times like each yeah. episode 10 i knew everything and uh so the offer to do a podcast was huge so i just started the weightlifting house podcast did one episode with him in person and then he flew back and then we started doing them basically weekly on you know just over the internet or whatever um so i have written down that we were doing that and then in May, so very quickly after, we had Kevin Cornell on as our first guest. Um, then I started doing a few episodes without Glenn as well as with him. So every week with, but occasionally during the week I do it without. So in uh, September, I got Kate Viber on. Mm, um, yep. She was like junior national champion. And I just had this, I just knew, I was like, she's going to be the best. I just tell it. So I was like, I got to get her on early. And then it turned out she did literally become the best, became a world champion. Um during that summer, I was like, I got to pan out the weightlifting house website. So I've got to do interviews. So I would, I would sit at the university gym where I was working uh, in the high performance center. I'd take my laptop in and I would just send emails out to athletes and be like, can we do an interview, like a written interview? And I did them with like James Moser, Ian Wilson, mm. Wes Kitts. Um, who else have I got written down? D'Angelo uh, Osorio. D'Angelo, Chris Murray. Like, you know, yeah. just like people who I just looked up to and I liked watching. I did those written interviews um, and and on the, and then I started an Instagram. I started posting like old lifts. Like my interest of weightlifting had led me to know more about weightlifting in like the 80s and 90s. And this new crop of weightlifting fans had no idea. So I could just find an old video of um, Vardanian hitting 404 in the total and post it and explain the story and the history of it. And people were like, oh, wow, I've never seen this. I do Pizarenko or I do Vyacheslav Klokov or all of these old lifters. And that's what weightlifting house was really on Instagram. It was just old weightlifters. And I still credit myself with like, I see those videos go by because they're all of these like, um, I don't know what you call them, like repost accounts. They just take popular videos and just repost them. And um, every now and then those old videos that are cut from me that I made, they do the rounds. Yeah. Yeah. And then it was in September. I was like, okay, I need to try and find a way to make money from doing this. Um, so I think I'd started a little bit of coaching at CrossFit Pi. So I was coaching mm. some weightlifting, uh, weightlifting classes and CrossFit classes 
to taking the weightlifting CrossFit classes. Um, I was like, I need to make more money. So I, I mocked up the YB Normal t-shirt in September, put it up for pre-order, and then sold it, like took orders like two weeks later, bought them because I had no money. So I had to take the money in advance. People paid me. I made the t-shirt, sent them out, kept the profit. Um, I think I sold like 120 t-shirts. I couldn't believe it. It was like so many t-shirts. Um, and it's still a, a good selling t-shirt. Um, and then on Instagram, I started doing like a series. I was like, how do I get more people to stick around after they see one post? What will make them stick around for the second, third, fourth, and fifth? So I was like, okay, I'll do series. I'll do what's the fastest snatch ever. Mm. And over the course of a week, I'll post seven fast snatches. Then the next week we'll do the quarters, semis, and final where the people decide. So they get engagement. And then I do the craziest save or the, most amazing squat, uh, back squat or whatever it was. And that got people joining, which is kind of interesting. Then in November of that 2017, I started the Weightlifting House News Show, which was a big deal, I guess, um, because no one had done that. And that's what Weightlifting House became known for yeah. for a long time. Is like summarizing all of the news that's happened over the week in one place. You can just tune in and listen to me talk for 20 minutes about the news. Um, a month later, it was the World Championships in Anaheim. So I just started like filming the screen and putting them up on YouTube. Um, and then January 2018 was the second Pendlai camp. Uh, it's a year and a month after that first one where I first met Glenn. And that's where we tried out the weightlifting house, American Weightlifting Barbell, which was, I, Glenn was going to start a new equipment company he thought it'd be cool if I did a bar, which was like amazing news to me, the weightlifting house bar. So we'd obviously spoken about it before that we were going to do it, but he had the samples shipped over. I got there for the camp. We all trained on it. We all loved it. And then I was on my Instagram earlier trying to work out the timeline of this on the 23rd of January. So literally like two weeks later, I posted a different end cap and it said the people's Mm. bar and it was weightlifting house and it didn't have any American weightlifting on it. So that must have been, I remember having the chat with Glenn in his house where I said, Glenn, I don't think an American weightlifting bar yeah. is going to sell in Europe. I think it should just be the weightlifting house bar. And I'd also like to sell the weightlifting house bar in the USA and just remove the branding that you have and just have my own. And you help me get the bars and I sell them. And you sell mine in the USA and I sell mine in Europe. And um, he agreed to it, obviously. He agreed and, you know, we sorted out a cut and a revenue share or whatever um and then by the 20th of february i put up a post saying the house bar is in production and that was when i had about twenty thousand followers on instagram um so yeah it was a year and three months after meeting glenn and the bar was in production and it was only gosh uh, 11 months after Glenn came out, like 11 months after Weightlifting House became a website that we were, that I was producing a barbell, which in hindsight is so crazy. Yeah. But um, I think because I had Glenn's expertise, he'd already sold tens of thousands of barbells that I instantly was able to get in with a good bar. And to this day, uh, I just think that's the best bar out there. The house bar, the original house bar, which we stopped selling because we had so many problems during covid and brexit and all these things they just became too difficult and then we built the business without them but at some point we've got to bring them back because they were the best bars out there um so that's how that started yeah with glenn was that a matter of him wanting to push stuff forward like push projects forward because he had developed you know i I, it's it's crazy how this works but i don't know how many people listening will be familiar with glenn um yeah. Is, is like as familiar as, you know, I think f- uh, five years ago, six years ago, like Glenn was the guy. Yeah. Like he was, he was like everything in weightlifting. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe 2015. Yeah. Um, it's like a staple in weightlifting. Yeah. And yeah. Now I'll talk to people and I'll kind of find myself like, oh, do you know who Glenn yeah, Penlay yeah. is? Isn't that so weird? It's, yeah. it's strange because, you know, he was a guy who for us kind of laid the groundwork by which we were able to tread. Right. Was it Glenn kind of like passively becoming involved or was he like, Hey, we should, 
we should do, I mean, I know you guys mentioned like, Hey, we should do a podcast. We should do these things. But like, as the, as weightlifting house was continue to ch- continuing to change and yeah. grow, was that facilitated by Glenn or you just like got him involved and you were able to like kind of partner up with him? So the, all of the media stuff was me, like the Instagram and the ideas and the podcast and the news show. That was all me. The t-shirt and then the second t-shirt I did was me. The mm. barbell was him. Yeah. Like I, I didn't, I mean, you can imagine being me at that point and being absolutely nobody in weightlifting, not knowing anything yeah. about manufacturing, just being obsessed with the coaching and programming and competing side of things. And like the idea of you then think to yourself, I'm going to produce a bar is so yeah it's like me now saying i'm going to produce a new federation it's like no you have no expertise in that so it had to come from him and he was like seb i'm gonna do a new equipment company because i've lost the name pendlay it's copyrighted and it's owned by rogue i think they Mm. bought it so i can't use my own name to produce my own company anymore which is crazy um so i'm gonna start a new one do you want to help and it was and then he was like i think he said oh we should joint brand it and then it was me who eventually said, I think I should, I'd like to do my own bar. Would you help? So I knew that the bar yeah. was there. I knew that the bar was amazing um, and it would look cool. And I, so I, I didn't have to do the the back end work of, of making that bar and establishing the relationships that he'd had decades or a decade, maybe decades establishing uh, in China. So I, I was able to just jump and he gave me the email address of the person and then you know, to this day, I'm in contact with that company. Um, like we just ordered like 47 kilo barbells and a bunch of technique sets, which uh, we made for British weightlifting. So like I still work with that manufacturer and I'll go back to them at some point when we do the house bar, but I'll never tell anybody who that manufacturer is because yeah, that is, I, I, it is the best bar on the market and mm-hmm. especially for the price. So uh, that's my secret forever, I think. <laughs> so what was it like, you know, I don't know how many people can become involved in something so organically see it through for so long. You know, again, a lot of this comes back to the amount of time I think you've worked in, in kind of, I can kind of jump on this, like, but I've worked without really seeing any return, like any, any like financial or any, any return beyond like, Hey, really love what you're doing. So you went from starting kind of like the, the, the idea of weightlifting house, getting involved with Glenn, actually developing it, growing it, yeah. somehow creating a barbell with Glenn, yeah. which like actually yeah. thinking about makes no sense. No. Um, and then, and then seeing it through to the, and I don't know when you're going to get to this kind of point exactly, but to the Pindlay camp where we were, we were training on it yeah, yeah. and it was like an actual like physical thing. Yeah. 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 Um, what was that like? Um, yeah, it was, it was weird. Cause like you said, we've done a lot of work, but we've not made anything from it. Like at that point I was making 600 pounds a month, which is $700 basically $750 a month plus maybe hundred quid from t-shirts. So $120 from t-shirts. So I was making way less than a thousand dollars a month. So my life was extremely, I found that extremely stressful, like paying rent yeah. and living. Um, it was, I found that very difficult and that was for years. I didn't make, I didn't pay myself a salary from weightlifting house until like, I don't know, 2020, something like that. Like yeah. years, didn't pay myself a cent. Um, I mean, I, I took in a few t-shirt sales early on, but didn't really pay myself a, a salary or anything. Um, so it was stressful. Yeah. And then, like you said, I mean, that year in the build up to meeting you, I think we started Pendle Award, which was an online mm. training. Uh, that I did with Glenn, we had the various programs and I would just help it, help him. And he realized that like I'd built this podcast and this following and all of the people who were signing up were coming through the podcast. So he wanted me involved. So he cut me in on that, which really helped. And I probably started earning accumulatively more like a thousand pounds, $1,200 a month at that point. Uh, and then, yeah, it was maybe a few months later. Was it like the end of 20? What, when was, when was the camp that we did? What time of year was that? I know it was in the summertime. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, it was um, summer of 2018. Yeah, that's when uh, I guess we had just started to do a couple of podcasts together. At that point, like the weightlifting house website was still 
it didn't know what it was at that point. I wasn't really selling anything on it except for like a t-shirt. Um, and I was writing articles as much as I could. And you messaged yeah. me and said, Hey, love the podcast. Can I, I've written some articles. Can I send them over to you and you publish them to this day? In fact, I don't know where it is now, but Charlotte printed out that message you sent me and I had it like framed. I had it like uh, <laughs> yeah. in my bedroom for like years. Cause it was like, and it wasn't even done because it was you. It was the fact that someone was, yeah. it was like, oh, wow, Seb, look, this person really loves what you're doing. You should remember this moment. Then it's just funny that Ooh. that turned out to be you. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but we started doing the podcast. You started your podcast. I came on yours a few times. You yeah. came on mine a few times. And then we met at the Pendley camp finally. We got to lift on the bar. I snatched a PR day one, fresh off the flight. You then beat it with 117, <laughs> which really annoyed me, keloed me. Um, and then I remember like while I was there, I was like, okay, obviously Glenn and I are going to do podcasts here. And I think I asked if you wanted to do one with us and you were so scared. You were <laughs> yeah. like, terrified to be on a podcast, particularly live with me and Glenn. Yeah. Um, but that was fun. Yeah. And did we do two camps together? Because we then did one like in the winter again, like six no, months No, I, I just did one. Just did the one? Oh. Yeah. Wow. I have yeah. a hard time remembering when, how all the camps fit in and everything. Yeah, I do remember. I remember those podcasts, and I remember to kind of to get a feel of how excited we were, and maybe yeah. how excited I was to just be there and, and hang out with Glenn and be a part of yeah. it all. Yeah. During yeah. the podcast, or like right before, we were literally eating like rice with honey. It was yeah. like something that like Ivan about uh, Abajev did or had his his athletes do. Oh yeah. Uh, so when Glenn talked about it, you're like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And suddenly you're you're sitting there ready to record a podcast with Glenn, and you're eating a bowl of rice with honey, and you're like, "This is the greatest thing ever." It's just like, yeah, it was like, okay, well, we've just done two sessions. We've got a, our big third session of the day later. Let's just get the carbs in. We just eat. <laughs> yeah, and we'd have stew that had been you know on the hob for a week and was like <laughs> smelling a little bit. We eat it, and it was epic. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was epic, and. uh yeah, I, I remember though. I feel like weightlifting house by that point had become something that was, it was, it was, it was more recognizable, and I think it was something that kind of felt special because I remember picking you up from the airport, and it's like, oh, this is this is Seb from from weightlifting house. Right, right. This is like a this is like a big deal. Yeah, I remember um, meeting him. It's funny. Yeah, yeah, and then and then I remember. Yeah, I remember that that car ride. Was it the first time I'd met you? I talked about like rowing a 2k faster than you yeah yeah was that literally like the first time i mean that was the first camp yeah yeah, yeah i mean it was like a week later but yeah i do oh, gotcha yeah that was, yeah that was... and it was like obviously you can't because i used to row <laughs> yeah and as you learned earlier in this episode i was upset i was pretty good um so i had a pretty quick 2k and uh especially for my body weight like I, as far as things go it's not amazing but i was like yeah. 71 kilos back then I, I think when i met you i was like 100 kilos but yeah. when i was a row i was like 71 and i rode like a what was it like a 6 30 something 2k i don't know it was pretty quick um and you tried and i think you died you just died you failed miserably you started off with <laughs> yeah. my pace and like 20 seconds in you were like i'm done yeah you yeah. really died you're in a bad way yeah uh, that, that was that was fun so what was what was the result of that camp because everyone lifted on the weightlifting house bar uh yeah. i remember it being yeah one of the best bars i feel like i'd used and then kind of where was weightlifting house heading after after that pen like game um so yeah i'm literally scrolling through the instagram right now so we did the the bar came out in about april uh i can see here and then oh uh, yeah here's our camp okay so i can see our camp we're still doing the, the podcast. Oh, then I started doing a Friday podcast. It was called the mm. Sinclair Countdown. I started that in yeah. March, so a few months before the camp. And then towards the end of the camp, maybe just after the camp, I got a message from Dan Kent, who has gone on to be one of the co-owners in Weightlifting House, where he was trying his hand at starting a new... He wanted to start a company that was a publishing company that yeah. published strength books for weightlifting, powerlifting, strongman. So he got one secured with like, it's like one of the best strong men in the world, like one of the best powerlifters in the world. And then he messaged me and he's like, hey, the Sinclair countdown is great. Do you want to turn it into a book? I'll turn it into a book for you. 
so we went through that whole process which is really cool so that was like it's such a weird thing that we were selling like two t-shirts a barbell and now a book it just made <laughs> no sense yeah um we did the we did that turned it into the great greatest weightlifters of all time really beautiful book really cool proper coffee table book with great pictures and stories and then after that that was like the winter of 2018 he basically said to me um okay the book's done uh i think we work together well i think because i've got like a good technical understanding of like he, you know he's like a a, a technology guy like computers yeah. and you know he'd set up multiple businesses like the the legality of setting up a business and payroll and all these sorts of things i had no idea about he's like i could join you and we could do that and i could help you build weightlifting house and i just didn't know anything and <laughs> i was like someone wants to help me this is amazing uh so i was like yes let's do it and obviously it turned out to be a really good decision just having another person there helping out was just so useful mm. Um, so Dan and I started working together and weightlifting house then was like, you know, I worked with Glenn, but I didn't, but weightlifting house was separate. Like, Mm. you know, if we sold weightlifting house barbells in the USA, I would just pay Glenn for shipping them out. But I wasn't, he wasn't like a co-owner in the weightlifting house bar or in the book, um, or in the t-shirts. Like those have been things that I've been building over the couple of years. Um, and then the vast amount of money that Glenn was making was from his equipment company that was doing pretty well, I think. And then also from the Pendley Wad, where he he had like quite a lot of athletes on there and he was making like monthly revenue off that. Um, So yeah, that took us into 2019, I guess. Me and Dan just trying to build weightlifting house. Um, I've got a picture here. This is from six months earlier. Um, Stronger Muscles, Improved Technique, and it's a podcast with Joshua Gibson. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. That might have been one yeah. of our first podcasts that we did together. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I remember going back and listening to those. Um, yeah. yeah. And I actually remember Dan, he, he reached out to me as well about possibly writing a book. And oh, at did the he? Time, like, I did not yeah, and at the time I was like, I had no confidence in anything that i knew. what was the book and what did he message you about uh i don't remember the details i just remember it's powerful publishing ideas or something similar. powerful ideas press yeah pa- powerful ideas press i just remember him reaching out and i was like i don't i don't know who this guy is i don't know what this yeah. is about and i definitely didn't feel comfortable or confident writing anything uh but i remember that's probably seeing, the difference between Dan. me and you isn't it because it was yeah. like I didn't have any confidence in writing a book, but I was just like, no, I was yeah. just have no fear of risk. I was like, I'll just give it a go, see what happens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I think that's right. I think that's definitely something I had to develop. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which and you still, definitely did. still, yeah, still, still, like working on it, but to a smaller degree now than yeah. then. Yeah. Um, so 2019 was actually so if if we were to kind of think about from it's going to be impossible to do this, but from 2012 up until 2019, what do you think was like, I mean, obviously getting Glenn to become involved, uh, going to the U S getting him to the UK. 2019 was where I think weightlifting house started to decide its own direction a bit more, Mm. um, by, by you going to, to world. So I think 2019 was like a big year for weightlifting house. So maybe you can kind of break that down. Yeah, I think 2019 was, that was the year where because Dan was involved, it was like, okay, we actually have to generate revenue because like, he has to make a salary and I have to make a salary. And we basically said like, okay, within a year from now, we have to be paying ourselves Mm. some money. And it was was like only 500 pounds a month. That's like within a year, we need to be paying ourselves 500 pounds a month, which is like $600. So that year we were like, what are we going to do? So I... I came up with the idea of tape, which I think I told you about on the last podcast. So I was like, tape is almost every weightlifter uses it and it's a repeat subscription. So once you win a customer, you have them like the lifetime value of the customer is extremely high because they don't buy $16 tape once they buy it 20 times. So really you've got a $320 customer is kind of how I was looking at it. So I was like, we've got to do tape. I reached out to manufacturers, found a manufacturer, sampled a load of tape, came out with the blue tape. And that was our first like, bigger project i suppose it was just weightlifting house that and the bars um 
we went to the British champs and that was the first time I ever held a camera because it was just a podcast at that point. Mm. Held a camera, fil- filmed some of the British lifters and the international lifters who came, Ilya, Toma. Um, and then continued to try and sell the bar, but it was it was difficult. So we would always take pre-orders. Like people would pay us. We'd then reach out to ma- our manufacturer, order 100 bars, have them come in and then just ship them out to everybody who, who'd ordered them. Um, and then in September... 2019 i flew to california and met you and you and i did like a a a tour basically we toured california we hung out with dave spitz at cal strength we hung out with max ater at max's gym we hung out uh at marin um yeah heavy athletics Marin heavy athletics like we didn't hang out with ian wilson which was devastating but we wanted to so that was sean waxman's gym Sean Waxman's gym. Yeah, we drove yeah. down to LA. That's where you and I became really good friends, I think, because yeah. we just lived together for two weeks. We traveled, we toured, we filmed. And those, and we filmed and we made vlogs. And that was the way the <laughs> yeah. YouTube channel began yeah. there. I then flew straight to Thailand for the World Championships, filmed, got loads of great sessions. And then when I got back, started editing them, found out that basic editing is pretty simple. You told mm. me to use DaVinci Resolve. So I was like, oh, I'll use <laughs> yeah. that. Downloaded that, edited, started putting stuff up on YouTube. And those first few videos got like, I think they were on like three, four hundred thousand views each now. Because yeah. it was like, it was back in a time where there was no, there wasn't that much content on YouTube for weightlifting of modern weightlifters. And like, you put up a video of Lasher training and it just gets 200,000 views instantly. And same with Lou and she and all these great lifters. So that took off the Weightlifting House channel in 2019. And in 2020, we did start paying ourselves like 500 pounds a month, which is great. And then I think that became 750. And then that became a thousand pounds each month. Um, And, you know, I started going to more competitions. Like I went to the Switzerland competition. Yeah. um, Challenge 210. Uh, I went to Qatar and lived with Ilya and Nisa, (laughs) which is crazy. I mean, two guys I looked up to. Ilya was like the guy I looked up to for so long. I mean, I remember to this day at the World Championships in 2019, Ilya walked in the room, all the athletes and coaches look over like, oh my gosh, it's Ilya, the return of Ilya. And Ilya just walks straight up to me, fist bumps me, puts his arm around me. He's like, how are you doing, bro? Because he remembered me from the British champs where he'd been, where I'd given him a signed copy of the book and I got him to sign my copy because he was in it. Yeah, I remember just feeling so cool. And then to go and live with him in Qatar. Then I went to Rome and filmed those guys. That was in the end of January 2020. And then... Two months later, COVID and everything locked down. And I didn't go to a competition for like, what, two, two and a bit years? Yeah. Which is insane. Um, but yeah, that first uh, summer in 2020, is that right? 2020? Yeah. That first summer of lockdown, um, gosh, I don't even know what we did. I just... I mean, I guess what we missed was the fact that whilst I was with you in California, Glenn died. Yeah. Yeah, which changed everything because in June or no, in July, he met, he called me in July. I remember being, I remember just having this phone call with him and he said, I have stage four cancer. It's like really bad and it's everywhere. Yeah. Like everywhere, and he told me all the places, and I and I was just like, holy, shit. like, uh, like it was just I was like, when, like, how long? And he was like, not long, like, really not long at all. Um, and it turned out that he lived like another two months. But what was crazy yeah. to me was he, when he called me, he said, um, he said, Seb, I've got stage four cancer. I don't have long. I'm going to die soon. Promise me, um you'll keep like, you know, he didn't say promise me. He just said, have you got the detail, the login details for Penley Watt? Mm. I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, you have to keep that going. Like you have to give them the programming until nobody needs it anymore. And I, it's just crazy. I, I always think about that. It's like, it's crazy that he was so obsessed with producing the best weightlifters that his training style that he developed over decades he was like, this in his mind, he's like, that's the closest thing we have to the best program ever. So it can't end with me. Like, you have to keep it going. You have to give it to more people. Um, 
so that was crazy. And then when I was with you, yeah, that was when Glenn died. I remember we woke up one morning and we found out and we went to Cal Strength, which is surreal because that was obviously where we'd first heard about him was when he was head coach there. And then uh, you and I just hung out there, like everybody else left. And we just, we went, sat in the car park and uh, we just chatted about Glenn. That was really weird. Yeah. I remember um, yeah. It, it's now that you bring that up, kind of like two things I just wanted to mention. One is going to the back of Cal Strength. And I don't, this is like, a, this is like such a niche reference for people who are listening. But you go to the back of Cal Strength and just like yeah. sitting there along yeah. like the fence line. We bought a pack talk. of cigarettes out of um, like, I don't know what the word is. It was like, an, on a, it was like a tribute to like what yeah. used to happen out of the back of Cal Strength. Because yeah. we knew that that's what Glenn and John and Donnie had done. Yeah. And Glenn had just died. We're like, we're going to do it. We're going to go sit at the back. <laughs> and and it, was one of those, it was one of those moments where you, you – and I had, this, I had this yesterday. But you just get this, like, feeling of, like, this is – this doesn't – it doesn't comport with reality. Like, it doesn't make yeah, sense surreal. that this is happening. Yeah. Um, we have, like, three minutes left. So I think this will act actually as a good break – for another full episode oh, of weightlifting house from the pandemic on because to be honest that's when like, the business starts it's cha- it's changed yeah. so much yeah, actually that's when it actually began yeah. um so the last the last question i'll leave us on you know for the last two minutes which i'm just not going to be able to do it justice or you won't but glenn's death i think impacted mm-hmm. you it impacted you a lot i, I could just tell like you were yeah. absolutely broken up by it i don't think i've ever seen i haven't to this day, I haven't seen you that like emotionally distraught. Yeah. What was that like for you? Having to go through that while you were in California <laughs> yeah, and it was just, not um, being able to see him before, before that. Yeah. Um, I don't, I sort of, I, I, I mean it when I say it, I sort of don't know. Cause I've not, yeah. yeah, I just, I didn't, some people really get stuck in the moment, not stuck. They just, they dwell in the moment and I, for whatever reason, like a protective thing, just try to move on. So I haven't really sat with my thoughts about it. It all sort of came out when I wrote the book. That's when I started really thinking about Glenn a lot. Um, but I would say that meeting Glenn was definitely the luckiest thing that ever happened to me. Mm. Like Glenn taking a chance on me. I mean, it's funny, like, you know, when you ask me all these questions about like, um, but where did it come from? Where did that come? Where did the drive come from? And I kind of think of things in my childhood that maybe led towards it. But actually, it was just from meeting Glenn. It was just like Mm. from Glenn, who I looked up to for so many years, saying to me, Seb, you have to have a website, you should start selling stuff and writing programming. Do you want to do a podcast? It was like, having that belief in me, from someone who I respected so much, is absolutely the catalyst to whatever I've done since. Like without that, I would be, I'd have probably just carried on doing what I was doing, which was, which was in a, you know, I would have gone on to be, you know, a weightlifting coach, just coaching. And hopefully I would have done quite well. I would, you know, that that would be phenomenal. It would be really cool if I could have done that. But I think that's what I would have done. Um, But Glenn kind of putting the belief in me to try something that was more in line with building a, a business within weightlifting that was everything. And so for him to then just die so suddenly was just like, uh, I don't know. It was, it was, it was odd. It was like, I was on my own again. That's kind of how it felt a little bit. It was like, Mm. okay, he was there. He was the guy who told me I could do it. And then, and then he just wasn't, it was like, Oh, but then I just thought, you know what? I, what would make Glenn proudest? Like if he, I always, I, I used to, I still do this sometimes. I think to myself, okay, imagine at some point you get to talk to Glenn again, which obviously isn't going to happen, but let's say it is. Uh, what's he going to, like, he says Ooh. to you, what are you doing? Is he going to be proud and like impressed if I say, oh, Glenn, I've built like this, you know, um, media thing now. Like we, we go to Worlds and we film it and I do the commentary. He'd be <laughs> like, he'd be like, oh, Seb, I'm so proud of you. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, he wouldn't say that. He would just sort of nod and go, okay. You know, that's all he'd say, but that's, that's enough. Um, but he wouldn't, you know, whereas I feel like if I said, you know, Glenn, it got too tough. It got too tough. I couldn't do it. I'm now, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm a investment banker. I feel like he would be like, he'd say the same thing. He'd go, okay, but he'd be disappointed. He'd be like, yeah. oh, you gave up. You're not who I thought you were. Uh, Cause I think when he met me, he thought, okay, I've met the guy who loves weightlifting as much as I do. And I've never met that person before. So I feel like I've got to live up to that and I've just continued to be the person who's more obsessed with weightlifting than anyone else. And so far, I don't think I've, it's different. We, we all are obsessed with weightlifting in different ways, but at least in the way that I am, I don't think I've met anyone to my level yet. So maybe I'll meet some kid one day who, who will be like that, but I haven't yet. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> this is what a, what an unfortunate, uh, time to have to end this but i think one of the most appropriate uh seb if people want to uh just i mean they know where weightlifting house is it's weightliftinghouse.com it's seb underscore ostrovich it's weightlifting under underscore house um if people want to contribute in some way or support support the brand uh well i'll say it's two things support josh through weightlifting house there are three ways you can do it Buy the great, uh, not the great, buy uh, the <laughs> weightlifter's guide to the snatch, which Josh wrote. Get yourself a ticket to Coaches Only, which Josh has put together, and use code FILLWL if yeah. you buy a product at Weightlifting House. All three of those things funnel money to Josh. So if you appreciate everything that Josh does in his podcast, then do one of those three things. Yeah, well, I'm still going to shamelessly plug myself. So that's yeah, Josh yeah. underscore Phil W L on Instagram, uh, philosophicalweightlifting.com and everywhere else. Guys, thanks so much for listening. And I'm so excited for part two. Uh, the next time you listen to this, we'll dig into weightlifting a house after the pandemic. Mm-hmm.